So my wife is a full-blown atheist, and I'm an agnostic. So I guess that makes me the optimist in the family. Says what he wants, but he's ever contradicted. He's a man of conviction, but he's, but he's never been convicted. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Man of Conviction. I am a man of conviction, and I have never been convicted. So that's why the show is called what it is. And it's not a religious show of any kind. But sometimes it gets religious, but, you know, it's not the purpose. And today on the show, I'm going to have uh, John Piricello. Um, it's coming out just a little late. He was here last night, and I just had to edit down. We talked for a very long time, and you people are in for a treat. A very interesting individual, uh, a good storyteller, and um, we shared a beer or two, and... We chatted about his career. People will know him from Barry. He was Detective Loach on the HBO series that is so good. He was also in Twin Peaks, Season 3, Phil Spector. He worked with Al Pacino, Helen Mirren. Really... um, impressive career and uh impressive dude and i'm glad to talk to him so let's get right into it all right everybody we are here with john piruccello perfect piruccello that's perfect even more perfect perfect no sapeto che che parla italiano si parla italiano si certamente uh, ha trascorso un anno in, in Italia. Uh, uh, fa, fa molto anni. Do, do, uh, 20 anni fa. Mi piace molto l'Italia. Mm, è vero. Anch'io. So, we'll cut that out. So, yeah. Why would you cut that well, out? Well, I, I won't cut it out. Who am I kidding? That's going to stay <laughs> You're just going to keep saying that. You're going to keep, <laughs> like, we'll, we'll be talking. About, I'm cutting that out. Fuck it. <laughs> oh, can I swear? Please, I would encourage any okay. bad language. Oh, goody. Um, because so, now you've got me drunk, you gave me a beer, and so I'm probably just going to start swearing. Yeah. Uh, for no reason. F- full disclosure, I rarely drink, but I bought this beer that had some, it looked good, and I'm gonna, I'm drinking it right now. So It's delicious. Absolutely delicious. This is a Mexican beer, am I wrong? Tecate. Yeah, yeah Tecate. Um, we met um, because you uh, are in a relationship with... <laughs> Love that in a relationship, sort of like a lawyer. I mean, I have an in re- <laughs> like my in relationship with my lawyer. You guys aren't married, are you? We're not. Yeah, That's so a, you're in a really. I wasn't. A, I, wasn't, I didn't want to say wife because I was like, no, I don't think they're married. You are. You are. Yeah. Listen, you wouldn't be wrong either yeah. way. If you said wife, I don't it, know that I'd correct you. It's damn. It's damn. I mean, you might as well be. I mean, yeah, yeah. We so, uh, we're tired of each other, so it's it's, yeah, it's like we're married, just like you're married. <laughs> Um, this is a high school uh, friend of mine. I, I've known Julie since um, eighth grade, and uh, we've always kept in touch. And uh, was that in San Diego? It was. That was in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. yeah we always. You uh, went to that fame school. I that... did. I sure did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was. I was doing uh, some acting and painting. I did almost everything there. Yeah, it was great. I had. A gr- I had a good time. Uh, Life changing for sure. Made me know for sure I wanted to be an artist in mm-hmm. some way, and like definitely not doing a nine to five. Like no, thank you. So, editing has really been the closest thing to that. Where I'm sitting in an office and I feel like, Ugh, and I'm not doing that so much anymore. So there you go. I didn't have any of that. You know, I was sort of wandering around in the dark. Uh, always knew I wanted to be an actor. Always since you know whatever earliest memories in the school play or whatever, but. Uh, I was always very sort of jealous of um, people like yourself that went to, and my and my daughter now goes to uh, the Los Angeles uh, High School for the Arts, Los Angeles County High School for the Arts. Is that one in downtown? It is, uh, it's in Alhambra. Oh, okay. It's uh, Loxa. And so, you know, and Julie and, you know, and of course I, when I saw the fame, you know, the movie, uh, it was like, oh man, wouldn't that be the greatest? And my school just didn't even have a theater program, you know? It was, uh, it, we had to go outside of the school to do community theater. And, right. And I did, which is great. 
uh, but I'm just saying, I, I, the, the sort of uh, demystification of being an artist, the life of the artist, right. was uh, I, I'm I'm really, really, really grateful that I got to give that to my kid. Um, I mean, she got it, she gave it to herself. She got herself in there, but uh, it's. Um, I think that's a big deal. I think it's a big deal. You know, I was always encouraged. You know, my acting was always encouraged by my mother, and uh, you know, she would drive me to these crazy community theaters that were, you know, in rural Vermont, probably 15 miles away sometimes or whatever, and got me into the plays with the, uh, you know, local college or whatever. So it's it's not like I wasn't exposed to it, but I'm just saying the sort of um, to be kind of uh, immersed, you know. Where in Vermont? Uh. What do you know? I know uh, somebody from Proctor near. Okay. Um, this would be south of there. Yeah. Um, what was the other one? Oh, uh, Rutland. No. Mm-hmm. Rutland. 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 Yeah. So I'm sort of uh, yeah. southeast of Rutland. I'm uh, down near the in the southeast corner, kind of uh, maybe a half an hour north of Massachusetts, okay. and probably half an hour west of New Hampshire. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I, I have yet to um, visit that area. I need to get up north of New York. I've, I've been to New York and a little bit of Jersey, but I, I've been to Montreal, but <clears throat> none of that northeast. You uh, went right past me if you went to Montreal, probably. I went actually through Flint, Michigan, and uh, and through <laughs> Canada. We we came in that way. Uh, but, well, that was very presumptuous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you 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 did not go anywhere near me by no, doing that. Yeah, no. yeah, that's. A, a circuitous, uh, circuitous, circuitous route. Se- secure, circular. Secu- yeah. You took a circular, a circle-like <laughs> route around. So we found out, or I found out, doing some research that you were also born very close. We have a similar birth date. October twelfth, uh, and I'm October tenth. I love it. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if you know you're not left-handed, are you? No, but I, I, I like ride skateboard. Goofy foot, mm-hmm. and I I play hockey left handed. So I, I I'm not left. I'm not quite. I wouldn't call myself ambidextrous, but it's kind of close. You dabble. You I dabble. do. I do. And I know. And I like eat with my left hand. I eat, I eat with a fork. Oh yeah, you're you're ambidextrous. I guess with the fork. Yeah, that's interesting. I eat with a fork. Is that weird? Uh, no, it's pretty cool. I uh-huh. I I saw the most amazing tip today on the internet. <clears throat> you know, you have a hard time hanging a. A, a painting on a nail because mm-hmm. like, you can't see it. You're kind of put it on, trying to oh. put it on the wall. You take a fork and you put it facing up over the nail, and it, of course it sticks up. Oh, and then you good. put the string or the wire over it, that's and then good. just remove the nail. That's amazing. It's the coolest thing I ever saw. And I said, "Wow, I can't believe that's not a thing." It, the internet for like hacks like that is just like it's so you, for all that's horrible about the internet. You see something like that, and you go, "Okay, all right, the internet has a purpose." Totally. Right. <laughs> I, I I put the I put the thing upside down, like I and then I can sort of see. Oh, smart! Like I like the, that and approach. The, and then I flip it down. But anyway, that's a good approach. But too. I'm going to use the fork method now. Yeah, me too. Fork and I just saw it today. Yeah, my wife and I both were like, "Amazing! <laughs> Look at this!" <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> so. You know, this show is about, uh, you know, talking to people in the industry who are interested in, like, kind of being on the inside and hearing what it's about. Can you tell everybody here listening, all 14 of you, um, <laughs> you know... Uh, I'm a listener. Yeah. Okay, great. So 15. We're awesome. Mm-hmm. I feel like close to 20. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, you started in the theater as a, as a boy, mm-hmm. uh, and that's how you got your taste of the... the the juice i can clearly remember walking out onto uh it was it was little abner was the play and it was a local college and it was kind of a uh uh oh my god what do you call that when it's like a like um oh another beer you don't have other beers do you oh i can get one yeah but you'd have to like stop and go get it you oh, don't no, have I'm one gonna here order, i'm gonna order one up you can order one up <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't your wife like in her robe when um, we came through? I'm going to get my 13 year old Mateo. Oh, okay. To All right. Get it, and All right. He's going to yeah. bring you a beer. All right. That's good. Uh-huh. Okay. So he, please continue with your story. I'm I sorry. Will. Little that's, Abner. That's fine. <laughs> so, Little Abner. So, I was one of the sort of rascals from the neighborhood. There was a couple of us, maybe three of us. And I really I remember 
I remember the per whoever I, I don't know if it's director maybe because I'm young you know I'm I'm a kid I'm probably eight eight or eight years old maybe or something uh -huh. and uh, and I remember he said um, just find a little bit like this is the first time I heard about a bit right he goes uh, just find what you want to do is you want to uh, come up with something where you just seem like dangerous or obnoxious or problematic somehow. And I'm sure I'm, I'm uh, um, paraphrasing, but, uh, and I remember I came up with this sort of idea that I would go out there and I would be boxing, right? It's sort of like, oh, hey, and here are the new kids that are gonna be part of your family or whatever. And then we come out and we're like awful, right? And so so I came up with this thing where I come out and I start boxing, like shadow boxing. Uh -huh. And we came out on stage and I'm shadow boxing everybody started laughing and uh and i just remember just being like just like filled with like oh i want this all the time like it was, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> like like i became uh uh like i was in i was hooked like right there my sort of ego went yep let's do this <laughs> totally and so from that on it was just kind of like a you know like a drug addict does or something I just like wherever I could find it I would do it if I'm in a school play I'm in the school play if not then I'm at the community theater and uh and I just wanted to do it all the time so it's um so it comes naturally to me but then there was kind of a large leap uh between you know the sort of demystifying how you would do that for a living. In fact, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say that it just didn't even occur to me. It was almost too, ah, oh, God, love you. Thank you. Beer has much. been delivered. A beer, beer is here. Been, let's hear it up. There it is. Boom. Here, Booyah. continue your story. I'll pour it for you. Thank you. So the the sort of the leap from that, from it being, you know, it's not, it was always more than a hobby, but the leap, but just the idea that you could, it was almost like a, it was almost like it was too big it was too big to dream about it or something. It was too big to even like think about that I might make a living at it. Right. And um and then I was up in uh, Oregon um in the early 90s, in the 90s I guess, and I was uh uh nannying for my aunt, my uh -huh. aunt and her and then husband um both physicians and so they didn't have a lot of time and so they had three kids. And uh, I'm kind of just, you know, taking care of these three kids and putting off life. I've graduated from college at this point. Uh, I've delivered pizzas. Um, you know, that was my first job with my college degree was delivering for Domino's Pizzas. I'm sure you were very efficient oh, I was about so it. good. I was so fucking good at that job. I loved that job. That might... We could talk about pizza delivering for, like, the whole podcast, but it was... Uh, I loved because there was already a guy there that was super fucking good at it. And he and I had this mutual respect, but completely competitive like relationship where, because, you know, when you start, when you deliver, there's kind of these exponential, you know, like, you know, once you get the most pizzas, then there's another bump and, you know, and then once you're, you know, the most money and there's another, so there's all these things that you're shooting for all night, these kind of carrots that they put in front of you. Uh -huh. And we were just completely competitive with each other. Like even cleaning up, like even afterwards, like cleaning up the store was competitive, you know. Folding was, boxes. Yeah, oh, oh, I was really good at folding boxes. Yeah. Like how fast you could do totally. it. All that, the whole thing. Anyway, so I'm nannying. And I'm sitting there on the couch one day, which is what I did a lot once the kids were taken care of. And this kind of local morning show comes on. And uh, and there's a woman on there from Sausalito, California, wherever the hell that is, right? And she is pulling people out of the audience and putting them in front of a mic stand. And they're doing voiceover. And she's saying, okay, read this. All right, well, now read it like this. All right, well, imagine this. And just talk to one person. Just talk to me and do it like that. And she's getting these, like, just you know, civilians, I'd call them now, uh, to do uh, voiceover. And I go, that's a fucking job? Are you, do that? are you kidding me? I could <laughs> totally do that. Are you kidding me? You yeah. get paid to do that? So all of a sudden, the mystification of professional actor kind of like disappeared. I went, if that's all it takes, I am going to go do that. And long story short, it is it I didn't it didn't quite happen, but I, I loaded up my my uh, Oldsmobile Delta eighty eight, overloaded it. It actually caught on fire on the way down to because uh, I'd overloaded it um, to California and from Portland. Loaded it up, drove to San Francisco, 
uh, found this person, uh, got an agent through there, and became a professional voiceover actor. And that agent said, well, why don't you get headshots? And I really? Yeah, maybe you should go out for on-camera stuff. And then, you know, the rest is history, so to speak. Wow. You know, so Interesting. So um, the one of the most high-profile roles you've mm-hmm. done was recent on Barry yeah. on HBO. That's the biggest one so far. You played Detective Loach. Detective John Loach. It's funny. He was Phil Loach for the longest time before anyone uttered his name. And then it wasn't until like season two that somebody said his name and they decided they wanted it to be John Loach. Makes it easier. I guess it was easier (laughs) to remember. I think one person says it or something. But anyway, he's Loach. That's who he is, yeah. Man, Cleveland. I know, isn't that great? You know, what's, you know what's funny? I did a show, uh, I did a show, uh, it only lasted one season. It was um, Josh Duhamel. Oh. So Josh Duhamel had a had a show, and it was sort of like he was kind of, you know, a little bit off because he had had like a weird past, and it's kind of mysterious as to what his past was or whatever, but he's like helping to solve crimes. And so I just had this one little scene on this show. I think it was the last episode that of that season, and they did not get renewed. And uh, in the elevator, he gets on the elevator, and uh, he, I'm going to Cleveland, and there's like a Cleveland joke in that. It's sort of like, uh, you know, where, where I'm like, he's like, where are you going? And I'm like, Cleveland. And he goes, oh, great. And I'm like, so you've never been to Cleveland or whatever. You uh-huh. know, it's like that. And then, then I sit down to do, uh, to do Barry, and there I am doing another Cleveland joke. And I've never been to Cleveland. I, I've met some really great people from Cleveland. There's something important about the Midwest. Don't get me started. But I've just heard awful things about that place. Oh, about Cleveland itself? Or no, just the state of Ohio. Uh, the How can a whole pe- state? Be I don't bad? know. You know, you're right. I don't. I shouldn't shit on Ohio. I mean, you're, you've just lost a li- <sighs> at least a two listeners just now. <laughs> you're right. Have like their grandparents are from from Cleveland or something. I've got listeners in Russia, mm-hmm. Spain. Okay. Uh, Canada for sure. So you don't fucking need Cleveland. Um, Fuck Cleveland. United Arab Emirates. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, <laughs> where else did I see? New Zealand and Australia. You are. Yeah, I'm international. You are international, <laughs> man. But I just named one listener in each of those places. <laughs> That's all you need. That's all I need. You know. It's just for the the metrics or whatever. You don't need. Uh... This is a perfect opportunity to remind people. If you want to support this podcast, go to Patreon. For $1 a month, you will get a decal that is high high quality you have decal. One? I do. Where you're, is it? You're going to get one before you go. I want to see it. Where is it? Okay, it's in the receiving area where we give the gift bag, which is not in in this area. You're getting a gift bag? <laughs> no, I'm really <laughs> shit. I've really dug myself a hole now. <laughs> Because, yeah, I'm kind of used to getting gift bags, so... Okay, let me text uh, Mateo again. <laughs> Only way. <laughs> Mateo, go behind the refrigerator, get a bag, and just fill it with shit. Bring it in here. So, um, you were on a television series with, was it, or no, a, a special with Al Pacino played... Oh, uh, I was on a, you know, it's a movie. It's weird. It's a movie. It is, but it's it was for HBO, and I guess it, that gets that's all going to change. I'm sure of it. But, right. but but as it is now, they call that television. They call Showtime television. They call HBO television. But that they, that was a two hour feature or whatever. It was a feature film, yeah, yeah. and it was Helen Mirren and Al Pacino and Jeffrey Tambor and uh, John Piercello and um, uh, all sorts of other great people were in that movie. Yeah, that was a great experience. David Mamet wrote and directed that. And um, you have a special relationship with David Mamet, do you not? I do. Right. You have you. He he kind of like saw you as a young actor and was like, "This kid, I'm gonna." I was kind of already a more not a young actor anymore, but yeah, he he um, he plucked me out of obscurity for sure. That's awesome. And that was a big. Um, I cut the line for sure by by being in that movie. In fact, I don't know if this is a secret or not. Who I don't care. So so. Uh, he just he said that John has the role. In fact, I remember him saying, "Hey, I wrote this role for you because we're friends. Like uh-huh. we became friends uh-huh. because our our kids were like best pals. Okay, and so we became friends. And so he was like, "I'm writing this," and I never. I don't I don't know why I feel the need to say this, if, if, but uh, 
you know when you know when you when you're good friends with somebody and the friendship is so important to you that you you're not willing to uh, risk. You know, I remember I'll I'll I'll, t- I'll tell you to you this way. There's an, I have another friend who's a casting director, and I remember her saying one time, uh, you know, these actors they they go, hey, I'm around if you need me. And she's like, I know that. That's what I do for a living. Like, yeah. I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm never going to bring up anything with her, you know, and I'm never going to bring up anything with him because, you know, they know what I do. Sure. And so one day he's out there in his, you know, garage. He's out there carving wood and he goes, oh, hey, hey, John, I, I, I wrote this. Uh, I'm writing this thing and I, and, there, and I wrote a part for you. And, um, you know, great. Oh, that's great. Okay, so what's going on today? And so whatever, a month or so later, he said, oh, yeah, I have that script for you. Yeah, you're this great, uh, what did he say? He said it wrong. He said, um, he said you're a reporter. You're a, pro- a reporter that sort of follows the, the lawyer around. And I read it, and there is a reporter in there. <laughs> and the reporter, you know, has like a line or something. And I remember going, that is so great. Like, God bless him. Like, I'm, you know, he thought of me and thought of me doing this reporter. So when I read it and like gave it back to him, and I go, hey, so, so Dave, what, which role? Am, am, am I? And he goes, he goes, you're, uh, you're Stavros. You're the cop, which is a much larger role than the, uh, than the like, reporter. Oops. And I went, Oh my God, this is, this is a big deal. So the point of the story was, is that HBO, of course, didn't know who the fuck I am, you know? And they're like, what do you mean? John Pertitello or whatever the hell, you know, like who is he mm-hmm. and why should we care? Mm-hmm. So again, I'm, I'm like giving up a secret here, but it's sort of like, uh, so the casting director said, do me a favor, just kind of um, give me some stuff. We're going to put a little thing together and we'll just kind of show them that you can act. And uh, so we did that. We put a few things together and then just so that they could breathe easier that, uh, Dave hadn't gone off the rails and hired his, you know, paper delivery boy or something uh-huh. to play a role. The point is, I had been sort of trudging away. It's funny, people say you're like, I was like an overnight success after 25 years right. or whatever. You know, I joined the I joined the union in the 90s, you know, like the late 97, I joined SAG. You know, people go, oh my God, it must be so difficult. It's like, well, no, because it just, it's whatever it is. And whatever it is, if you're... You know, I sort of feel like I'm, I joke that I'm afflicted by this, right? It's like an affliction. And so it's like, I don't, it's like, they're going, oh my, it must be so hard to have cancer. You know, it's like, well, you know, I mean, it is what it is. You kind of just put one foot in front of this <laughs> with acting. It's sort of like, it's like, well, if I'm not working, that's what it is. And if it's, you know, you know, whatever, whatever it's going to be is what I have to deal with. And so there's no point in sort of quibbling over whether it's easier or hard or whatever. You yeah. just kind of do it. Yeah. And, um, you know, you stick around long enough and David Mamet shows up. That's what I like to say to every young actor. Just stick around long enough and eventually David Mamet calls you and puts you in a movie. And that's how you become... People really ask me that. They go, well, how do, how do I get into it? And I'm like... And I always say, well, I can tell you how I got into it, you know? And I think you, every, you ask 10 people and you'll get 10 answers, you know? But here, I'll, I'd be more than happy to... And I am. Like, if an actor comes up to me and says... Can you? I, I always will have coffee with them or talk to them on the phone or whatever, because I feel extraordinarily fortunate to have health insurance and to uh, have a pension and to have what apparently is a career at this point. And so I I try to pay it forward whenever possible. Totally. So anybody listening, you are more than welcome to find me on Instagram or whatever, and I will be answer any questions you have. But, Very cool. Yeah. yeah, I called him and said, "Hey, you want to come over?" And he's like, "Yeah, sure." He was, he, and and here he is. Here I am. Well, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to use this example. Uh, my friend Carrie Scott, who uh, Julie also went to school with back at uh, SCPA in San it's, Diego. It's stunning to me how many people are. Fr- she's got like five or six friends that she's known since she was like ten. Yeah, and that's. Between ten and fourteen, yeah. like she has you included. Yeah, I just I find that spectacular. That's uh, it's also because fairly local. I mean, San Diego's still in striking distance from here, you know. And it's but she kind of moved around. She kind of went out, and she was you know she was in. Uh, I mean, she was born in Canada. Do you know that? In case she's passing herself off as an American to you, you should know. Oh man, that's what she's it is. That's what Canadian. it is. Yep. One thing I do remember is that. 
two of her parents, both of her parents, <laughs> studied geography. And I remember That's I'm right. being fascinated with geography, and I remember her talking to me about that. And I also remember that her parents... I think that's how her they, parents met. Well, there was a there was this weird thing like her mother is married to her it's so stepfather it's and so her beautiful. stepfather. It's Basically, so beautiful. Two couples decided became friends and then decided that they liked each other's wives or mm -hmm. each other's husbands, and there there was sort of a mutual decision to get divorced, swap, and they're still friends. You were doing so well until you said swap. Because I said swap to her mother, to her lovely mother. And that was the bad... That was the bad. worst thing I could have said in the world. I thought I was just being, like, you know, whatever, accurate. Right. And, uh, nope, didn't swap. Now, full disclosure, this is at the memorial. Her husband had just died, and we're at Julie's stepfather's memorial. <laughs> so, oh, man. Yeah. No, I'm, timing is everything. <laughs> uh, and, and so I said swap. I, she goes, we didn't swap. And I said... Oh, okay. Uh, well, sorry. Uh, when when you guys switched, she said we didn't switch, and I went, "I'm gonna just bail now. I'm gonna walk this. away. I'm walking away now and going <laughs> to get some cheese blogs or something." Because, but uh, but you had it exactly right. That you said it exactly right. The two couples got to be friends and mutually. This, you were doing so well till swap it was great uh -huh. uh, and, and you how could you know? <laughs> no. like I couldn't have known either <laughs> but but uh, uh, they 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 decided that the other now and to their credit, both you know the, 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 they're still ha had her stepfather not died, they'd all still be married 20 years later, you know so it was correct what they did. Uh, but it to me, it's the it's beautiful. It's how that the worked most out. <laughs> incredible thing that I'd ever heard in my life. And of course, to Julie, it's just like, well, yeah, that's my family. I mean, you know, like it is for all of us. Right? Yeah, it's like, uh, what's weird about that? It's just how it is. But yeah, that's correct. That yeah. happened. Carrie, this I was going to say, um, Carrie Scott, who used to be Carrie Fisher, who had to change his name for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> he um, he said he was working on Twenty One Jump Street with Johnny Depp and Brad Pitt in Vancouver. Oh, wow. And he was like one of the buddies. Mm -hmm. and, they were, and they were out at a bar in Vancouver after shooting. Johnny Depp was there, Brad Pitt, and Johnny Depp's double, body double. <clears throat> and some lumberjacks came in and caused some, hey, hey, actor boys, what are you, you know, and there was some, <laughs> there was some, and so a fight broke out. Yeah. And... They they got bruised up pretty bad, and so mm -hmm. so he has this cool story. He, you know, he basically was like, "I was in a bar fight with Brad Pitt and Johnny Depp in in Vancouver." So, <laughs> so not to put you on the spot, but do you have any stories along those lines? Or like, man, let me tell you, when I was Al Pacino and I were doing lines in the bathroom, or not not quite along those, you know what I mean? <laughs> Let's see. So, really, what you're asking me is, do I have an interesting story? Not that's going to get you in trouble or get get anybody. In, Arrested I or... don't think I have anything okay. that would get me in trouble, but um, the the whole idea that I'm even in Hollywood and that I'm, you know, working with Helen Mirren and Al Pacino and Alec Berg and Bill Hader and David Lynch and David Mamet and uh, Henry Winkler and Henry Winkler and you know Jeffrey Tambor. Jeffrey Tambor is one of my heroes, by the way, because Larry Sanders show was like the greatest show in the world. Agreed. And 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 Tambor, that you know Hank was absolutely my hero because that performance was just stunning to me. Agreed. And uh, and so you know, and here I am working with him, and he's a lovely, lovely guy, by the way. Um, so you know, it's very, and I keep seeing that. Like I'll see, I'll see. Uh, you know, whatever. Some of these people are going, oh my God. Like, I'll see Helen and I'll go, we like worked together for like three months. Like, I know her. Yeah. You know, we hung out, had dinner together and laughed. And it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't really, it's like a dream. Like the whole thing is such a, you know, and I work, I work really, really hard. And I've sort of, you know, put up with a lot of um, stress to be where I am and I've just not left you know I've, I've stayed here and yeah. stayed with it so it's not like you know I don't take it for granted and I don't uh, but you know the fact is I'm extraordinarily 
lucky, you know, extraordinarily lucky to not only be able to do this for a living, but to be operating at the what I consider to be the just the highest levels of of my profession. You know, I'm very, very proud that I can, you know, just even when I'm not doing it, when I walk around, it's something that I do. Yeah. Like I, I belong somewhere. Yeah. You know, and like as a sort of a disaffected youth or whatever, I mean, I was a sort of a punk rock and kind of didn't uh, anti-establishment. Yeah. And, and um, which is kind of funny uh, that, I'm, that I play all these cops. I played a lot, a lot of cops and, and <laughs> just the idea that I'm playing cops when I was scofflaw, you know. But I just feel extraordinarily fortunate to to be not only doing this for a living but operating at the just challenged constantly and constantly being able to work with the best people and uh you know it's just I, andrew mccarthy was my director on monday i was i did a episode of good girls oh cool and andrew mccarthy was, i'm like a look at him going that's so weird, man, that your weekend with Bernie and here we are talking about this scene. Uh -huh. Very strange. So it's sort of like a dream. It's yeah. Kind of, it's kind of like I'm in a dream. This whole thing could be a dream, you know? Mm -hmm. This whole... I wouldn't be surprised yeah, to find out, thing. you know, yeah. that it is. I wouldn't be shocked. No. But as uh, the prophet uh, Tori Amos said, you know, this is not really happening. You bet your life it is. So it may be a dream, but I'm... Um, I'm going to treat it like it's real. All hail Tori Amos. The prophet Amos, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What am I up to? What am I doing these days? What's uh Yeah, tell me tell me what what's your latest what's your next uh project? Uh, well, I'm working on a show on Showtime right now with Brian Cranston and it's called Your Honor. You are you are on the cord there. I don't know if that's going to affect your impedance or I'm just going to say things that okay. <laughs> I don't know if they mean anything. Um, on, dude, I can't drink. I know, right? <laughs> We're, it's the greatest. Though you have no idea. I had such a stressful day today, Matthew. You are doing me a huge favor by having me over and well, giving good. me beer and good. just chatting with me because I just was very, very stressed out today. In fact, um. I'm going whatever. I'm going on a trip I'm, uh, for two days, and then I'm back, and then I'm going to a memorial, and then I have a day off, and then I'm going back to uh, New Orleans where I'm shooting the Showtime show with uh, Brian Cranston's show called Your Honor, which is based on an Israeli uh, television show about a about a judge whose kid um, kills somebody, does a hit and run and kills somebody, but the person that he kills is like a bad person, and so the judge is sort of goes down kind of a questionable moral rabbit hole, you know, as to what he's willing to do to protect his kid and the rationalizations and whatever. And um, and I'm a, a cop, of course. I'm a sheriff, you know, of the town like I am. It's a sheriff on Twin Peaks and sheriff on this. And sher and I was a de whatever deputy. I was a detective on Barry. And uh, I just play cop after cop after cop. And, and I, think, I think the reason I work right now is is because of my mustache. I believe that my mustache has the career right that now. That has the power right now? Yes, the mustache has the power. It's a very cop-looking mustache. Yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah. It, uh, it, I can, you know, like it was yesterday, crystal clear, you know, these moments in your life. And uh, I had the audition. It was a pilot, you know, for Barry. Uh, was it a pilot? No, they'd already shot the pilot. So it was to be on the show. And um, I think I had, another, I had another pilot that same day. And... I had had a beard for Twin Peaks, and so I was like, I don't want to have a beard anymore. I'm going to, a cop can't have a beard, you know. David Lynch's cops can have beards, but I don't think real cops have beards. And so I'm standing there talking to Pete Gardner, who's, um, you know, crazy ex-girlfriend. He's, mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's a great, great actor. And uh, his son and my daughter are a thing, right? Okay. And so I'm over at his house, and I'm just, we're talking, and I'm just, like, staring at his mustache. I have this this Barry audition coming up, and I'm just staring at his mustache. <laughs> and I'm going... And he's like, eyes up here, buddy, yeah, up here. exactly. <laughs> he probably was. But I finally said to him, I go, your mustache is so amazing. I'm going to have a mustache like yours. And uh, sure enough, I went home, and I shaved it. And I think I kind of did, like, as I had the two auditions, right? I think I had to uh, kind of split the difference between, like, cop 
mustache and then like school administrator mustache or something for the other show or whatever. But either way, um, my, it was like it was like a, the hand of God or something came down and shaved <laughs> my face and said, yes, you will be this person now with a mustache. I don't know. There with probably is something to it. Dozens and dozens of police type roles to come. Oh man! I, if you'd have told me at the time, I mean, I, I don't know. I wouldn't have believed you. But but it's it's like in fact this thing for um, this thing that I did for Good Girls. I'm, I'm like a a beverage delivery guy, and my agent was like, "Hey, you're not a cop." <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, but I get to shoot a gun. Wow. And this was the, it's funny, I, I, there's like a progression, right? Like you, like I remember the first time I had a gun was on that Mammoth movie. Uh, and I just, it, it was in my holster the whole time. Tell me the name of that movie again, please. Uh, Phil Spector. Oh, right, right, right. It's about, yeah, it's about Phil that, Spector's uh, trial. Right. And, um, Sorry, that, I, I didn't connect the two. I think most people don't know my career. Like you're in the, you're in the norm, you're in the majority. Okay. Um, so it's okay. I did do a little research. Not enough. Yeah, what did you find out? That you speak Italian. <laughs> and that David Mamet found you. Yeah, plucked me out of obscurity. Yeah. I don't think it says younger on there. there. I mean, for some reason, I don't know why I'm thinking. I was, I was in a Horton Foot play in uh, on La Brea at the Lost Space, and which is a very historic uh, theater in Los Angeles, the Lost uh, Studio. Uh-huh. And um, I don't, I don't think that was the original location, but that that studio, uh, Horton Foot, came to the goddamn play. Wow! Sat in the fucking front row, and uh, did you know he was there? Uh, yeah. Oh, boy. it was terrifying. And so, <laughs> in fact, it was more terrifying than when Mamet came. Then Mamet came. So Horton Foot and David Mamet both came to see me at that play. Yeah. Wow. And Horton Foot, um, rest in peace, uh, died about six months later. And so that was like the last thing he ever produced. And then David Mamet came, and then their kid was sick that night. We were sort of starting, we knew who each other was, but I wouldn't say we were friends yet, you know? And he came with his lovely wife and then wrote me a little note because they had to leave at uh, intermission. Um, and they gave the note to the stage manager, and it just said, You're so great. Wow. We're so, you know, so glad we came. And uh, it's funny. I remember. I remember saying to the uh, to the box office, like, "Don't don't tell anybody he's here. Like the actors are. They don't need to hear that. They can find out later." And then just like all of a sudden, like the stage manager came running. I said, "David Bam, it's here! <laughs> it's here!" Everybody was like, "Wow!" <laughs> but uh, very yeah. cool, man. Yeah. So so um, I'm a lucky guy. Um, I kind of jumped the line with that with HBO, and then, you know, it's funny. You you come you come into this business, and every t you look at that a job like that, and you go, well, here we go. After you know whatever, I've been trotting along for 15 years now, or whatever, and here we go. I'm Helen Mirren and Al Pacino. My career is now gonna go somewhere, and you know, you still work. I mean, I still I don't take it for granted, but you sort of think that's gonna put you to the next level. And then it doesn't, and then and then all of a sudden, through incredible circumstances that don't make any sense to me, I'm you know a regular on the third season of Twin Peaks, which is a weird coincidence because Julie actually was pals with Dana Ashbrook, right? Back in the day, you probably knew Dana I do, too. I did know Dana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. And so that was a strange coincidence, and she 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 was deep in that world, yep. and I of course was a fan of the show. And so then you go, well, here we go, David Lynch, Showtime, here we go, and not so much. And then Barry comes along, and Barry, like, you know, that everybody has seen it. And so every room that I walk into, they're all, they've all, they're appreciative, and they've seen it. And it really kind of like, I mean, you can't, I can, I, I'm not comfortable sort of um, letting my guard down or whatever, like, you know, like, it's not like I can ever coast. But there is something very cool about, um, having your reputation precede you so to speak yeah. you know so that you don't have to you can just kind of do the work you can go in there and do the scene and do the work for the audition or whatever it is and there's a little bit of buoyancy you know that comes along with that that i'm that i'm grateful for i think because i've never had it right so i'm super grateful for it and people recognize me like on the street that's another weird thing you know people sort of uh will just kind of you know they've seen it and 
it, it makes me wonder like how many people are not saying something, you know, probably a lot more than are. And then it makes me wonder like, well, God, what is it like to be like Al Pacino? Where like literally everybody knows not only who you are, but they've seen all your movies and everywhere you go, they're staring at you. And so it's, but there are people who just don't pay that 15 bucks. It's so funny. Yeah. That, like, and, and I always say that's like my mother, like, like my mother goes, Oh, well, what, well, where's it going to be? And I go, HB, and she goes, Oh, I don't have that. Right. <laughs> I go, can you get it, Ma? I'll pay for it. A year. I'm giving you a year of HBO. That's exactly what I said. I go, I go, well, well, how do you get your television? She goes, well, through the cable, of course. And I just go, well, it's a cable channel. And she goes, well, I don't know how to get it. Well, you call them and you... Turns out she had HBO. Yeah, yeah it turns out she had HBO, exactly. I think she did finally see it. And it was... Um... It was funny because she uh, she just like after she saw it after she watched season one she went on and on and on about Paula who plays my partner you know Paula Newsom and uh, who's a great actor and uh, and it was just funny to me she just like went on for like ten minutes about how great Paula was and then uh, and then she's like oh now did you know that your sister you know, <laughs> just like moved, uh-huh. moved mom <laughs> anything <laughs> yeah anything mom anything no okay all right that's cool no biggie all right. Well, we can continue this as long as you want. I can, I can, uh, you can have another beer. You can relax. I Listen, can I'm notes. so, I told you, I was so stressed <laughs> out, and this is so great, Matt. I'm so happy to be sitting here talking to you and drinking a beer. It's lovely. Well, I certainly hope we can work together in some capacity uh, in the future. Uh, yeah, I would love way. to do that. I have, I have a few ideas, uh, kind of uh, improv related, um, putting some actors together that don't know each other. But I have information about the scenario and then meet up and film it for real without having. Um, I love it. Yeah. I love it. I couldn't, I couldn't love it more. I don't like it. I love it. Okay. Well, great. Yeah. I, I have a couple of people in mind and you for sure. And oh, uh, I would think it would be great. And I, I just, do you know Jeremy Rabb? He's, um, he was in our movie, um, Fell, Jumped, or Pushed. That um, I don't know if you saw. Oh, you did. Todd, yeah. yeah, he was the tall director. Yeah, dude yeah. Did it. Um, yeah, yeah Jeremy. You, you played it at your film festival. Correct. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yes. Um, yeah, Jeremy's um, a funny guy. And well, you know, Im- improv is. Um, you know, improv is basically my religion. It's uh, that woman that I told you about in Sausalito, the woman that I went down to find to teach yeah. me voiceover. I remember being taking a class. You know, I was making five bucks an hour and living in a room in this guy's house on a foam mattress. You know, I just had no money, so I had to save up. It would take me like months to have enough money to take one of these classes, and so I would finally take one of these classes. And then uh, one day, I'm sort of leaning on the counter, and I said, "Hey, uh, so innocent at the time. Hey, you know what? I think I want to learn about improv. Does anybody know about?" Where I should go to learn improv? This is in Sausalito, right? It's in San Francisco Bay Area. And um, this guy, Michael, goes, um, he said, yeah, you should go to Jim Crana's workshop at Fort Mason. And that is just the most sort of, uh, it's a cataclysmic sort of moment, you know, that as a, in retrospect, because it just absolutely changed everything. Like my, my uh, discovery of improv and then my obsession with it and then it became my social scene and it became my kind of how I met people that were in the industry. It became my way into the union. It became just... Uh, and I think I think what it did for me is that um, it kind of it kind of put me in a in a mindset. I like sort of look at improv as a mindset you know, more than a set of skills. It is a set of skills, but I think more than that to me, it's a mindset. And that mindset serves me even when I'm not making up stuff, even when the stuff is totally scripted and I have to stick to it or whatever. That's sort of the idea that everything's going to be okay, even when it's not okay, it's still going to be okay, is kind of probably... I mean, I could I could go back to every audition for every show that I've done, and improv has been a critical element of all of those auditions. They so. they want somebody who gets the words, but then can just do something else with it. That yeah, yeah. And, and I be think, able to be able to uh, if it falls apart, be able to stay in the scene and still that's right pull it together. That's and, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Because I think sometimes people misconstrue like. Oh well, I should go in there and I should make things up, or I should, 
change things. And I'm I'm always of the mindset of like I don't I don't change anything or make up anything unless I absolutely have to. Like it absolutely has to happen. I I would rather not make something up uh, or change it. So I'm doing my best to stick to what's you know with the task at hand. But if things go in this direction, I'm more than happy to go in that direction too. You know. Are you familiar with the long form? Do you like long form? I remember learning the Herald and remember thinking, okay, because Del Close, of course, is the sort of god of everything, right? And so he's he's our he's a he's a he's a prophet, right? He's he's an important uh, part of the whole um, of the whole improv uh, world, and uh, he came up with the Herald, and. I remember learning the Herald. The Herald is like no rules, is what I was told. You know, it's like no rules. You can do whatever you want. And I remember thinking, as a young improviser, being like, "Bullshit! Like, there's there is rules. Like, you you have to do. You have to get this, and then you have to do that again, and then you have to do." And I was, I remember being very um, anti-establishment as an improviser. I was very much. Uh, I didn't want to be told what to do, and I thought the Herald was. Uh, bullshit in that it presents itself as something without rules when it in fact has rules but i i uh i probably don't know it well enough to to really be able to criticize it i know um a guy named rich tallarico i don't Mm -hmm. know if you know rich he was a writer on key and peel i met him on the tonight show um he just sold the del close story oh that's great the he and his younger partner like they i guess they they weren't lovers, but they maybe were briefly. But like mm-hmm. he was like this sort of this like younger life partner woman. I can't, her name is escaping me, but they have the rights now, and they're they're, they're doing terrific. it. It's, it's it's happening. Yeah, that's a story that should definitely be told. Yeah, I mean, my mentor was Jim Crana, who ran that workshop, and Jim had actually knew and worked with Dell, right? And uh, he he was with the committee, and the committee is of course a very sort sure. of you know huge uh, foundational and. Um, but he told me a story once about Dell Close where he said um, he went over to Dell's apartment and, uh, and Dell was very excited and very manic. He was like, Jim, 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 this is amazing. I've, I've, uh, I think I've found like a, like a portal, you know, in the time space continuum or whatever it was, you know, like th- th- there's a, y- y- you got to watch this. And Jim's like, okay, all right. You know, cause we, we, you know, that's what we do. We accept, right. And uh, accept the offers. Okay. And, uh, and he goes, watch this. It, it's a very, it, there, there's, you have to do these things exactly in this order. And, uh, and then, and, and, and you'll, you'll, you know, and then you'll you get transported. And so he said, uh, Dell kind of like, started walking around uh the room he goes you got to come over here you got to touch this lamp i'm paraphrasing you got to touch this uh lampshade and then you come over here and you walk across this rug and then you rub your hands on this bookshelf and then you walk around the circle over here and then you 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 walk once you know once around this this sculpture then come over here and then touch the uh touch the uh, uh this hat put this hat on and then you walk over you walk over and stand right here and he walks over and stands in it and uh, he like <laughs> He's like shaking, and Jim looks down, and he's stepping on exposed. There's an exposed wire <laughs> on the floor, like for a lamp or whatever that's like sticking out, and he's like shocking himself and doesn't realize that he's uh, that all of the the preamble was superfluous. That is an awesome story. Yeah, and who knows? You know, don't let it, the truth get in the way of a good story. But uh, that's that's Jim, that's Jim's uh, Del Close story. So. Uh, Rich Tallarico, if you're listening, you might want to include this in your movie. It sounds <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> it's uh, well, of course, it'll have and 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 Jim Crana, who's uh, yeah, he's my mentor and uh, just loved him. But he passed away a couple of years ago, and um, so it'll be sort of uh, maybe somebody else has was also told that story. But that's basically the story. It's funny that it's sort of a game of telephone now from Jim to me to and we can't go back and ask Jim. No, but it sounds it sounds very plausible. I mean, you know, Dell when you see any picture of Dell, he just has like, almost like a wild look in his eyes. He has a very he's like electric, you know. He he definitely was alive on the planet that guy. Yeah. You know, for sure. He knew how to live. He really did. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's like, uh, those guys are like Magellan, right? Like, those guys are out beyond the precipice of the known and sort of searching for, you know, I, I like, I was, um, I remember one time in Jim's class, uh, I was a huge Andy Kaufman fan, right? I loved sure. Andy Kaufman. And because what I loved about Andy Kaufman is that I, 
he put me in a place where I didn't know what was fake and what was real. And I love that. Like I love, I love being confused, which totally. is, which is good for me because I'm confused a lot. So it's works out. <laughs> but, uh, that, you know, that feeling where you're just, where your brain, where all of a sudden you are completely operating on all cylinders because you do not know what the fuck is going on. Yes. And you are trying to figure out and trying to, as the greatest headspace that there is. So anyway, so so now I forgot why I was saying that. Why the hell was I saying that? Now I've lost it. Shit. Wow. We could rewind. I, this is only two beers. I don't really drink anymore. Well. But I do now. This is lovely. Good. You're going you're gonna to stay here for a while. I'm not going to let you drive. Oh, right? oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Get some coffee. Yeah. Make your, Have your son make us some coffee. Yeah. Well, let me text him. <laughs> He's, uh, what, in probably like high school at this point? Is he in high school the, the yet? 13-year-old is in... Uh, eighth grade. He's in eighth grade. Yeah, he's about. You know, he's almost whatever. He's he's in the middle of eighth grade. And then my older boy, uh, Max, is in um, in eleventh grade. So nice around here. Uh, yeah, yeah, close enough. Um, yeah. he's at Grover Cleveland, uh, in Encino. My you wife. You don't need to tell the audience yeah. where your children you're right, are. You're right. He's I older. Didn't, uh, you can edit that out. I can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is for sure the longest I've gone. Ah, but that's as good because you know. Uh, you know, Thank it's you. very easy to and chill to talk to you. You, you will never hurt my feelings. You can do whatever you want with it and cut it out and whatever. Maybe but, we'll break uh, it into two parts. Into a two part. I cannot. I cannot fathom that this is interesting enough to to be a two parter. To be a two parter, but it's almost like, yeah, like if you you chop it down to ten minutes or something, and I don't even know what those ten minutes would be. I got plenty. The Del Close story, maybe. Yeah. Well, I. I, I we're over an hour, so it's... We're over an hour now? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that, oh, that's a time. There you go. Yeah, I have a timer. I can check One to hour see. and two minutes. So anybody that's listening now, this is at one hour and two minutes is the actual time. So whatever it, it is, when you're looking at it, you'll know how much you cut out. This will be fun. Do math. We can do some math. <laughs> do a little math. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it's a, I think it's a... Um, I feel so privileged if i might get just weird for a second Please. but i feel so privileged to be a part of anything really like as a as a sort of a lost kid the idea that i found something that i love yeah and that it loved me back and that there's a place for me in this thing you know the the, the in show business yeah. which you know for better or for worse it's my thing right yeah. and uh is it's such a I'm so grateful. So when somebody like yourself makes a podcast to like talk about it and sort of demystify it, to yeah, use that word exactly. again, and yeah. to sort of like say this is a this is a thing. It's not just what you see up on television. It's not just this whatever glorified whatever it is. These are people that you know go to work and uh, and work with each other, and it's a community. You know, it's really a community for that, sure, that for we're sure. in. You and I are you and I are part of a community for sure, and. Just the idea of that, you know, whatever the 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 athletes have their community, and the you know whatever politicians have their community. Everybody, and we have our community, and so the fact that you're kind of, I don't know if you're deconstructing it or whatever it is, you're sort of talking about it, is showing how the sausage is made. I think it's cool. Yeah, I think it's cool that you're kind of normalizing our thing that we're so privileged to be a part of. You know. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, get some more listeners and. Uh, Every week, I will be putting one out. I've been I've been steady since uh, October tenth, my birthday. I uh, I've been putting one out every week. So how about that? Yeah, that's well. I'm um, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's an honor. My pleasure. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, thanks for the beer. Anytime. Now uh, I'll stop recording and we'll have some coffee. Have some or something. coffee. Yeah. Yeah, and then I'll go uh, t- uh, bring Julie her dinner. Excellent. <laughs> Which is in my car. Oh, it's in the car. Yeah, I made uh, my favorite dish in the whole world is peppers and onions and salsa with sausage. You know, sausage. Yeah. But it's my favorite thing that exists. It sounds great. And and late in life here, it occurred to me, because this is how dumb I am, is that I go, I could just fucking make that. You know, I would go to like Bay Cities and buy it. And wherever I go, I would buy it and eat it. They had it. The the craft services had it, you know, the other day when I was making the show. And then I just go, I could just, you know, when I was in college, I used to make my own my own uh, tomato sauce. I would add a paste and whatever, and I'd cook it for 14 hours. Uh-huh. And I was like, I could just have that. 
And Julie has an Instant Pot. And I am now in the cult of Instant Pot because I made the greatest sausage and peppers and onions. Sounds good. She'll ever. In fact, you can have some. I'll, I'll, I'll bring some in. You can taste it. Wow, well. well. I, my wife's making a, a beef stew right now. Oh, I don't want to compete with your wife. I don't want to get she into might a be battle. Offended. I don't want to have <laughs> your wife would kill me. She'd kick my ass. I don't want to. I saw her. She looks tough. She is tough. Yeah. She has a low center of gravity, and she can really <laughs> take you down. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will. I will. Keep, I will keep it. I'll stay in my lane. Okay. <laughs> Thanks again, John. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. That was John Piricello. Longest conversation uh, of the podcast so far. So if any of you actually stuck through, wow, thank you. I appreciate it. And if you're diehard, then I'm going to ask you now to go to Patreon and become a member. I have some really cool decals and bonus content for the brave. So please sign up and support this podcast. I only need about six people to cover the cost uh, so let's do it thanks <laughs>